Welcome. Uh, okay, everybody here is from Texas, I assume, pretty much. So, <laughs> Texas, yeah, Texas forever, baby. Um, I'm from Texas, but uh, I'll get into it a little bit later. Like, I'm not from from Texas, I guess. I'm born here, raised here, went to high school elsewhere. Um, so, is everybody ready to Dockerize your React containers? Yeah. Yes. I, I wanted. I knew this was a single track conference, so everybody would be here. But if I had a multi track conference, this is this title. Take this title, and you will fill an entire room. Just people will be like, I don't know. I just know that I'm gonna. Uh, if I if I don't go to this talk, I will be unemployable in six months. <laughs> um, so I loved the previous two talks. I loved both of them. I endorse everything that I heard so far this morning. It makes me super happy that people are talking about the emotional and pragmatic aspects. Um, Dave is a surprisingly pragmatic programmer. Somebody should do something with that. Um, uh, I want to thank Saron for starting this uh, hashtag. I actually follow it. I've never participated in it because I'm super shy, but um, I, I follow it most Wednesdays and sort of just look around. Uh, I get labeled a senior dev by people that I trust their opinions on stuff, but I totally, totally feel insecure about my code and about being a newbie about stuff. Um, I started learning to program six years ago. Uh, we didn't have cool code schools and stuff like that, and, um, but I had a really amazing community of people that helped me learn and come up to speed on uh, how to program, and uh, some very, very kind people took time out of their lives to, uh, to pair with me and, and grow me as a developer. And, um, I'm anything, any success I experience as a developer is a result of a huge community of people. Um, and so I'm super grateful that this exists. Uh, the, the, the struggle is real. <laughs> like, it's very scary if you're new uh, and, and vulnerable. So uh, I had a bunch of code uh, in these slides. I mean, a ton. I had about 20 minutes of technical content I cut uh, for this talk. So you're welcome. There's no code on any of my slides, I don't think. Um, so yeah. We're going to talk about Dockerizing or whatever, right? Actually, we're going to talk about midlife crises. Um, a midlife crisis is complicated. Some of you have experienced it. Some of your parents have experienced it. Uh, but basically, it's you start facing your mortality, and you decide to make some rash decisions. So this is my dad uh, when he was just a shade younger than I am now. Uh, he shares my enthusiasm for fanny packs. Uh, this is not my dad, this is his brother, but it is my dad's midlife crisis car. And at school, a lot of kids used to come up to me and be like, is your dad a drug dealer? <laughs> and I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think he was, but maybe we had some sort of like Breaking Bad situation going on. I don't know. So I think we've gotten to where we sort of sit around and fixate on the mortality of the tools and, and things that we use and our current base of knowledge. And that leads us to start making some rash decisions. Like, hey. Cool JS framework, right? The web reinvents itself every 45 seconds now. I wish it was 14 years. I, I live in JavaScript. It's every 14 minutes. So it's tough to think past the next framework we're supposed to learn, or you become immediately, permanently unemployable, right? So you got to learn that virtual DOM. So I'm Brandon. I help run the front side. Uh, I think we're doing something kind of special there. It's a, a consultancy focusing primarily on these sort of front end problems and, and new tooling around that. Uh, we're working on a catchy slogan so that people know who we are. Uh, I'm totally open to feedback. I'm just sort of spitballing here. So let us know. <laughs> we're thinking about buying some TV ads and stuff, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm going to use the history of Rails and my experiences learning Ember, uh, which is a client-side framework that's famous for being authored by an anthropomorphic hamster. So first, let's talk about the state of web development today uh, and explore that a little bit. I'm going to make some predictions for you if you are the type of person that wants to keep up with the pace of new tooling, language, frameworks. My prediction <laughs> is pain. So the first pain point I want to talk about is just the keeping up part of it, right? Have you guys uh, all web packed your Docker file in Gulp yet, right? Why not? Oh, wow, you're still using NPM2 to shrink wrap your React? Get, that's like so last month. Uh, all the tools, just the variety of tools out there, you just stare at it, like opening the fridge and just looking inside there and being like, I know there's like a thousand things, but nothing sounds good. Uh, people talk about this stuff, like you're supposed to have evaluated these thousands of options, and you haven't heard of two thirds of them. Maybe it's like, maybe this is a problem for people like me once you get too old, I don't know. Uh, Ember's about three and a half years old now. Other frameworks have sort of uh, have launched and come up since then. A lot of them, actually. Uh, I want to know, in what universe could there be 24 best JavaScript frameworks? <laughs> like, are any of them actually any good? Like, that's the saddest thing I've ever seen. Anyway, uh, 
All right, so what's your favorite technology? Just, you can, we can shout it out. Elixir, whatever, I don't care, it's dead. It's already dead, uh, according to Google Trends anyway. Uh, literally everything that you use is now unpopular and terrible. <laughs> so let's take a moment to remember Rails. <laughs> Node shot it down at high noon at Framework Gulch. It's a sad day. See you at the crossroads, Rails. Uh, MySQL died so long ago that only the old timers in the room are gonna remember what it was back when we still use relational databases. <laughs> Ask your grandma to tell you about those sometime. Oh, that poor MySQL dolphin. <laughs> my favorite front end framework got killed this year because a library showed up last year and it's time for me to pack my stuff up and move on. Oh, Tomster, no. You're like, I can still hear his little voice, please no. All right, I think everybody will remember uh, the, where you were the day that you heard that Ruby had died. <laughs> so, oh man, this conference is a bad time to reflect on that, but we can <laughs> hug it out, I guess. Um, the thing is, all of this stuff is totally predictable. So predictable, there's actually a chart for it. And there's a company called Gartner that gets paid a lot of money by a lot of companies to chart where these tech trends fall on this cycle every, I think every quarter or every half year. And turns out, once it's gained popularity, technology is harder to get rid of than Steven Seagal's toupee. <laughs> so let's take a look at this cycle through the lens of Rails' history. Uh, how many of you remember this? Um, and let's see if I've got audio. I'm gonna try to just... Please, please make sound come out. Whoops, it worked. I want to listen to that again, it's so good. Okay, so how many people here remember this? Okay, so if you have not heard of this, please do this at some point. Please go watch the Rails build a blog in 15 minutes. Uh, it, was, it was the technology trigger. It's the thing that launched this thing into the, into the like, stratosphere of uh, programming hipster uh, awareness. And, but of the people who saw it, how many people saw it at a time where you were completely blown away? All right, those people are totally old timers. But I, was, I, I wasn't even a programmer yet. Uh, but yes, you just dated yourself, sorry. Uh, I wasn't a programmer yet, but the, the, the tech lead from our team brought this and showed it to me, and I was like, I want to do that for a living. That looks awesome. He's like, it's not all this easy, and he made me go learn Ruby first, but that's, that worked out really well. So this trigger is marked by Hacker News commenters and tech analysts that trip over themselves to present and rank and predict the future of tools in this phase. Uh, and then it hits this thing called the peak of inflated expectations. And I don't think it gets any more inflated than this, right? Let's reflect on how this was a thing. <laughs> what? Where's my magazine cover? I want, a, I want that. And Ruby everywhere, getting started with Ruby. Ruby, the enterprise glue. It's like, this is, this is gonna change everything for us, right? It will fix everything, it will fix all of your problems, all your dreams will come true. And you have these like thousand tutorials where everybody writes a blog post and none of them actually help you understand anything. And then you go to a conference and the talks on this technology are standing room only. Uh, and once you do figure it out, the promise of the productivity gains means you're finally gonna ship web apps 10 times as fast as you used to, obviously. And that means you're finally gonna wow your boss. You get the raise, you buy the house, you'll fulfill your wildest hedonistic dreams. And we'll talk about the real promise. That's not the actual promise, but that's the one that we sort of buy into. And all these inflated expectations also tend to inflate our egos a little bit. Uh, like anyone who came before you was totally wrong, and you are the one that's totally right. And come on, the cheat, you're taking this baby to the moon! <laughs> Except there's only one problem. Like drinking expired soy sauce, the fun can't really last. And you hit the trough of disillusionment. If you remember how Google Trends informed us our framework died, and there was much weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, this phase is marked by prominent defectors. The thing that caused people to leave for your greener pastures is now causing them to leave for other greener pastures. Go figure. So remember this? Maybe you don't. Hopefully, we don't have to get into this. This guy eviscerated rails. And the consequences were never the same. <laughs> this dude in a blog post literally offered to fight every developer reading it. It was amazing. 
So Rails still reeling from this like unstoppable attack left the opening for Node to go in for the kill, and now Rails is dead forever, and none of us have jobs. So that's the amazing thing, though, right? Once the super early adopters declare a tool dead, it actually starts getting to do some real work. Uh, you know technology is being put to work when it has to speak XML over non-RESTful endpoints. And this is where those blog posts start turning into book deals, and a loose affiliation of enthusiasts turn into a real community. I actually like the word community. I like the idea of community. I don't think it has to necessarily equate to tribalism. Um, and then all those enterprise dollars turn into race cars. So a little gratitude would be nice. And finally, you hit this plateau where a bunch of people become quietly productive with the technology, and they don't really see the need to talk about it anymore so much. And there's nothing exciting or cool about quiet productivity. You don't get any more magazine covers. It's been a decade since MySQL died and did anything cool. But billions of dollars are pretty cool. <laughs> Billion with an S? That's like multiple cool. Rails is a, like, it's irrelevant whether Rails is a good technology or a bad technology because it's an entrenched and productive technology. Now you're seeing sort of the middle part of this, the early to middle part of this process again with front end frameworks. That initial spark of interest hits a few early adopters, and then the Hacker News crowd just like piranhas this up. And it's good attention, it's bad attention, doesn't matter because it's like off to the races. You've heard of this thing now. And then here again, being unaware of the pattern, we assume this new thing will solve all the things. This is where people new to Ember are astonished with how much work they're not doing. Does that sound familiar? And it's the hottest thing in the world for that moment in time, and it feels great, inflates your ego, and then suddenly the rocket ride is over, and it starts feeling like work, and you get your prominent defectors and the wailing and the gnashing and the what have you. And then if the tech survives that trough, some tech doesn't have the inertia to kind of pull it through or it, for some reason was so fixated on hitting that peak that it doesn't really survive the trough, you start seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. The tooling gets better, the learning materials get better, the community, community starts growing and stabilizing. And finally, you get to that plateau where a bunch of people just become quietly productive and they don't really see a need to talk about it. Here's something I promise you will never see on the front page of Hacker News. <laughs> Um, yeah, we've been quietly productive with Ember for about 18 months. It's pretty nice. <laughs> Boo, that's boring. Go home. There's nothing new there. So hype isn't an insult. It's just the process that we, that we work by. These are the peaks and valleys of any successful technology if they make it out of the trough alive. And once you know this stuff, you can set yourself up for some career success instead of being at the mercy of this cycle and feeling like you're being steered into a mountain. Uh, there are ways definitely to lose it. You can watch as your skills turn into commodities and become trivialized and devalued. You can burn yourself out trying to keep up, or you can side with tech that isn't gonna make it, or you could just opt out entirely and be a Fortran programmer. That pays actually pretty well. So you can't be Gartner. That $7 billion is spoken for, but you could be like a trainer or a consultant during the peak. But as an individual dev, I think that if a tech doesn't crash in the trough, getting to that plateau of productivity is where the wins are. And how to win is actually sort of dependent on your personality type. And so all of this information is a little bit uh, information overloading. We haven't really parsed through it yet. We haven't taught you how to pick the technology. But once you understand your preferences, you can focus your attention on where it's most valuable. A friend recently sent me this article uh, that articulates a theory that I've had for a while, that there are like three predominant personality types among technologists, the pioneers, the settlers, and the town planners. Pioneers itch for the latest technology. They like fording the rivers. They like contributing. They like exploring new territory. It's all about the thrill of discovery. Settlers try to create order from the chaos that those pioneers discover. They build infrastructure. They build communities. Uh, they build the, the first you know, shops and hospitals. They connect that pioneering work with real business and user needs. And finally, town planners are just trying to get things done at a scale and performance that isn't possible in those uncharted territories at first. Uh, and they're trying to take that exciting tech and turn it boring. And they always win. So let's dive back into history and see how this kind of fits together. My theory is that DHH is actually a settler who was sort of pushed into pioneering uh, out of uh, frustration with existing tools. I don't think many people, or, and certainly not him, would disagree that his ideas were lifted from, from true pioneering people that were exploring, like Martin Fowler, or people that, that were pushing new ideas out into the world, and he was sort of synthesizing them. Um, I moved 
to Austin from Utah a few years ago, and they love pioneers in Utah. Love, love, love them. They get their own holiday on July 24th. It's bigger than the 4th of July. Um, I think tech is similar. We love our pioneers. We raise them up, and we make them heroes. Um, and so they show up early, because they like this phase. Um, in the pre-014 beta, which was like the 1.0 release candidate, uh, Rails was strikingly similar into, uh, to the look and feel of the Rails you use today. But if you try to actually use it, you would die a death of a billion cuts. Um, much less, oh, deploy it. Who here has deployed Rails pre-1.0? OK. And the reason that you don't see more is they literally died. <laughs> uh, quick aside, we had, uh, we had a, a Rails. We couldn't figure out how to deploy it anywhere. So uh, this was like 2000, late 2005, early 2006. And we had a Rails app sitting on a box underneath Rusty's desk, Rusty, Rusty our, you know, our uh, venerable lead developer, and next to it was another box that had our billing server on it, and you would know that Rusty had accidentally kicked the billing server because our customers would call and say they just got billed 14 times. <laughs> so like these days were not good. But then the settlers arrive, and they're like, that's insane. You cannot do that. Uh, people need guides. They need infrastructure. They need books. They need supporting libraries, deploy tools, hosting services. The settlers are all too happy to look at those as opportunities to help and to build and grow businesses. Back in, if you were doing Rails back in you know, 1.0 to 2.3 era, you might have had nine gems starting with Access. And I think we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Ryan Bates for starting Railscast back then. Uh, Heroku and Slicehost got their starts around this time. And then interestingly, around 3, Rails was created to fight these architecture astronauts that had set up shop and fragmented Java's web culture. But as the needs grow more complex, architectures had to respond. And the much reviled computer science folks uh, take over some of the development of much of Rails, bringing modularity, relational algebra. Like, I don't even know what that is. That sounds awesome. Uh, big, the big money starts moving in at this point, and the Rails tent has to get bigger. And suddenly you have things all the way from code schools to enterprise needs being covered by this technology. Now, I had no intention of becoming a historian, um, but the actual history on this stuff is pretty scarce. I'd love to dig in. If anybody here has, uh, uh, you know, remembers stuff or wants to talk about it, uh, hit me up after. I'd love to buy you lunch and, and talk about this stuff. All right, so let's see how these three uh, archetypes play out in a successful community. Everybody actually has all three of these personality types in this big soupy mess internally. And, and, and so it's, it's an oversimplification to say you're one or the other. But I think one of them is, is usually dominant. So let's pick what, what irritates you. Uh, is it most irritating to be required to use outdated stuff? Is it more irritating when your team members come in and they're like, I want to build it. You know, I'm not going to name any names. It's some invented framework and language in, in the back end and the front end and um, the middle end that they just invented. And any, or is anything that gets in the way of shipping at all? Like, look, just let me do my job. Do you like merging pull requests? Or do you like applying a technology in a way that makes your company real actual money? Or do you like solving the trickiest performance problems? Uh, where do you feel the most helpful? Do you like extracting shareable libraries from your side projects you're doing? Do you prefer improving somebody else's documentation? Or do you like automating some tedious deploy process and make the other developers 10 times more, more productive? Um, each of those is really valuable. But if you find yourself siding with the first answer, you might be a pioneer. More on the second answer, you might be a settler. And on the third, you might be a town planner. All of those roles are important. Pioneers do the experimentation, and they help define a sense of what the future could look like. Settlers connect that with real problems and opportunities, and town planners help scale and help that grow to large numbers of people. So settlers and town planners might call pioneers hipsters that are swept around by fad technologies and call them millennials or whatever. And pioneers often get mad at settlers for exploiting their work for notoriety or commercial gain. And town planners get called out for lacking a sense of adventure and being architecture astronauts when they're just trying to make things stable and scalable um, and predictable. So as humans, we're wired to be dismissive of those that don't share our default opinions. Heard React was good. So we take on each of these roles at different points. But it's to our advantage to learn, lean on what we're best at. Me, personally, I'm totally a settler. Absolutely. In the, in, like, solidly in the settler camp as a default. Um, and which is, which is, you know, doesn't necessarily mean I'm a sociopath. Uh, so let's jump, though. Like, OK, what am I supposed to do with any of this stuff? But great, thanks. You've, uh, you've given me my cosmopolitan quiz. Uh, well, let's map that out in the cycle, in the hype cycle for your personality type. 
And you, you simply just can't get wrapped up in trying all of these new technologies that comes out. There's 12,000 of them. Uh, 13 million Google results. I'll wait for one of you to, maybe we can divide and conquer and get through all of them today. Um, you just can't, right? So when you feel obligated, though, to check something out, you just need to be able to answer these couple of questions. What stage is it in? Should I concern myself with it? Um, and, and based on your, on your type, you can kind of know whether it's OK to, to avoid something or if it's time to start looking at it. Pioneers are best served, though, by grabbing new interesting things as soon as they come out and become interesting to them. Settlers can kind of hang back and just watch, and planners can completely ignore it. At the peak of inflated expectations, where the magazine covers are happening and uh, all that stuff is happening, it's time for the pioneers to shine. This is like they get to train, they get to consult, they can write blog posts, they can become core team members. There's lots of uh, opportunity for both uh, uh, community contribution and exploiting it for commercial gain, tons. Settlers can exercise skepticism, uh, but they do need to keep an open mind. And town planners can just keep their head down and keep shipping with the tools they know. Now, once a tool hits the trough and, and you start seeing prominent defectors and all that stuff and you see the signals of a trough of disillusionment, the pioneers can exit the ride. They, they have made all of the, the changes and progress that they, they can. Uh, they can change roles to become a settler and stick it out, but they have to recognize that their role has actively changed. You are no longer a pioneer of this technology. It has caught on and other people are grabbing it. Uh, now is the time for settlers, though, uh, to step in, learn that technology, make, uh, make a judgment as to whether it's going to survive and be valuable, and town planners can uh, glance up from their desk or go back to work. Uh, pioneers, at this point, are totally done. They're out of the picture. The technology is climbing the slope of enlightenment because enterprising... Uh, the, the enterprising sellers have uh, written books, they're establishing consultancies, they're building products, they're creating a support infrastructure for this thing. The town planners need to start running through some of the new, to new tutorials that are coming out. So you, even if you're a town planner and you're really productive in what you're doing, this is the time where you need to start exploring one or two of the new things that are coming out. In the plateau, settlers can apply the now low-risk tech to novel business problems. Uh, town planners can help automate and improve performance and create enterprise scale solutions. Uh, the, the toy solution, this used to be a toy, right? But now it's running Fortune 500 companies and it's running your bank transactions. Okay, so what about leaving? What about getting stuck in a rut? You might be wondering when it's time to get off that plateau. Uh, but the good news is, if you're doing little bits of exploration according to what your personality type is, you never leave anything. It's like Dave was talking earlier. He still loves Ruby. He's just doing something else. You wind up finding yourself working toward a different plateau with a different stack uh, when you have a different kind of problem. There's no big dramatic exit. There's no blog post why you left X and you never hit Hacker News front page. I'm sorry. Um, so in summary, if you want to turn this cycle to your advantage, you have some pretty simple prescriptions based on your own preferences. If you're early, help people reduce the risk of exploring the new technology. If you're in the middle, find novel ways to connect it with business problems. And if you're late, scale and auto automate and take advantage of the fact that it's commoditizing. Um, there's one warning in all of this, and this eliminates maybe uh, 11,997 of 12,000 frameworks. Um, there are technologies that bet the farm on maximizing that big peak and hoping that that carries them through the rest of the way. And it never works, unless, unless you're trying to raise a bunch of VC cash and disappear. Uh, and you wind up in like Cabo San Lucas. Uh, that could be a plan. You could figure that out. Uh, you want to look for tech that has a vision that carries you all the way to the plateau. Here's some warning signs. Any tech that says it's sitting at the intersection of popular framework X and new language Y, that is a deal breaker. A slight variation is a modular alternative to a popular framework. Just look out if it trades on the popularity of something else. That is a deal breaker. A five kilobyte micro framework that, you know, I'm gonna stop you right there. <laughs> Shut it down, deal breaker. These pitches are not speaking to any sort of eventual gain in productivity. They're appealing to the peak of the hype cycle. So with that in mind, let's say you're investigating front end frameworks. Uh, there are already people who will uh, ev help you evaluate for specific criteria. So let's, we'll stay back and, and uh, analyze it from a more philosophical perspective. Um, so your instincts are actually probably pretty good. Most people in here, no matter how long you've been a developer, you probably know when something is like sort of fishy. So you should be able to aggressively prune that list and filter out peak-seeking missiles, and you'll be left with a, a few front runners, which is great. Uh, from that point, any of the frameworks that you're probably familiar, familiar with can be used to fit any of the needs. That's just straight up true. This is going to wind up being sort of personal preference. Uh, you'll have an easier time if you play to the strengths of the various frameworks. 
Um, backbone is solidly at the plateau of productivity. If you've got a bowl of jQuery spaghetti and you can't truly refactor it into a framework, Backbone has you covered. Uh, Ember is pulling out of the trough of disillusionment and starting the, up the slope of enlightenment. If you want to build a native web application from scratch against an API, uh, it's got Rails-like tooling to get quickly up and running. Um, uh, if you want to add a drop of functionality to server rendered pages and keep the mental model really simple, React is totally your tool. There's also a third-party router, and it's got a growing community. It can do most of the stuff the other framework can do. Uh, React is absolutely at its frothy peak. I went to a, a front-end conference called Fluent this year, and the React talk was like packed, standing room only. Uh, and it's a serious contender, though. It can back up the hype. Uh, and it's actually had a big impact on the, on the other frameworks already. And let's be honest, you're already using Angular. <laughs> it, it's entered the trough around the time they announced uh, 2.0, but it's pulling up the slope as well. It's similar in terms of its place on the, on the path as Ember. Um, but it's already in your code base, so if you've got it, there's no reason not to use it. Um, in terms of uh, capability, the frameworks all seem to be converging on using components and a router to tie them together. Uh, now, in terms of your personal type, Backbone is pretty appealing for town planner types because you just need some organization around the code that you were going to write anyway. Uh, Ember is perfect for settlers that want to leverage a community of people to build native web applications and not have to write all that code themselves uh, or write boilerplate code or maintaining a stack of build tools. Some people find that very appealing, and I, I will never understand that. Uh, React is just exiting the phase where it's targeted at pioneers. Uh, it has several ideas that are so wacky that they totally worked. It actually turned out to be really good. And everybody hated them at first, and it turns out, uh, my business partner calls it uh, their haggis technologies, which I, he says they, it looks terrible, sounds terrible, and it's actually very delicious. But I won't know, because I will never try haggis. <laughs> uh, Angular is great for settlers and town planners. Uh, it's a pretty simple model of uh, supercharging your HTML by giving it dynamic new primitives, backed by data and two-way binding. And, with 2.0, it's showing a lot of similarity to Ember. There's a lot of cooperation happening between the frameworks right now. So watch for the ones that are converging, because that's really nice. Uh, React is wonderful. Angular and Ember are wonderful. Uh, this sounds like a tough thing to evaluate for community, but really after interacting on Twitter or whatever with some community members or visiting a couple of meetups, uh, you should be able to answer a very simple question. What are your nicest, smartest friends using? I think the Ember community in town is absolutely stellar. It's second to none. I invite you to check out the meetup sometime, uh, Ember ATX. Uh, there, uh, also look around for Angular or React meetups. But for heaven's sake, please, please no. <laughs> Just don't do this. Let's write our own. Or maybe you're the world's itchiest pioneer and you gotta, you gotta do it and just get it out of your system. It's fine. So great, you picked a tool. It targets the plateau. And now you even have a, a fun toy app built on top of it. So you finish the tutorial, you have this not quite ready for a production app, <laughs> it's working. You know that feeling, right? I got this. And then you're like, okay, let's put it in production. Ah, crap. <laughs> you gotta come back down. Um, so this is uh, my friend Jameson, he's a very uh, clever, cool, funny dude. And, and he's pointing out, like, we buy into that peak of inflated expectations. It is okay, it happens. Um, I just need to take a moment with this. This is like, basically the only thing is to open up Hacker News and pick whatever the most upvotes. We've had some trouble with reliability lately, which is why it's time to rewrite everything in Checks Hacker News. Failed Kickstarter projects. <laughs> just sub in whatever is on there that day. Um, the, the reason is it's expectations, right? Uh, how many people here, by show of hands, have written a proof of concept that got put into production? Okay. So I look forward to the day this happens to you if, you, if it hasn't yet, because it will, unless you have iron, iron will. Um, it takes like six months or more to actually get it production ready. And you're like, yo, this is the same piece of software. What's going on? Maybe that's what they mean by a 10x programmer. <laughs> that's 100% me. Maybe the problem is your boss thinks your proof of concept is production, and the expectations get inflated because at the beginning you demonstrate this incredible velocity with this new tooling, and people expect that output forever. Like, hurry up, we need the feature, what's the holdup? And all you can think is, wow, this worked so fast, it worked so well earlier. Um, and it's like this personal exploration of tech follows the same curve. You made it to the other side with Rails, you've made it to the other side with one or two other pieces of technologies, why would you do this again? Um, why wade through the trough of disillusionment? Well, even if you're a pioneer, you have to see a new technology to your own, your own personal plateau. 
Clearly, you pick the technology for a reason. It's curiosity, intuition, a problem you have to solve, whatever. The pain is higher, it takes longer, so why in the world are you sticking this out? But I wanna uh, talk about something that's happening in our industry that may be difficult to notice if you're right in the middle of it. Ponder this for a second. The way our whole industry works has flipped upside down in the last few years. It used to be you take your technology and bring products to market with it, and now people are bringing product demands and we're making technologies to make that happen. And we've been swimming in this avalanche, and we didn't realize the fundamental shift that has occurred. User experience is driving the technology choices we make now. So we need tools to manage the complexities of this new UX-driven architecture. Sorry, client-driven UX is a thing. Deal with it. <laughs> um, Ember is a mature and robust answer to this. Angular is a mature and robust answer to this. React is a mature ing, robust answer to this. And there are other tools out there, and there will be more. So if you've been doing this long enough to, uh, to remember selling the idea of installing jQuery into your app, does that sound familiar? Now that sounds completely bonkers, but it used to be something you had to fight for. That's where I believe client-side uh, UX is headed. So Ember crossed this chasm. Other technologies have crossed this chasm. Uh, sometimes it really is time to bail out in a technology. Like It's just not going anywhere. It's not solving the problem. Uh, like Dave said, it's like your code will push back. But if we're not careful, that process of bailing and moving to something new and new and new uh, can trigger this eternal mid-career crisis. And if you notice this pattern in your work life, where you're like, I got it, I got it, oh, wait, I got it, I got it, oh, wait, I got it, oh, hang on, oh. <laughs> Maybe check if you're getting to any kind of plateau or if you're actually getting close to your goals. The tools that have staying power, like Ember and like Angular, tend to push through that thing where they optimize for that first Hacker News comment and that first 15 minutes of productivity buzz toward long-term plateau. I want so badly to ship stuff. I just want to ship stuff and make my users happy. And I thought Rails and then Ember would free me from all of the hard parts of doing that. And that's not true, or it's not even possible. But I did buy into it, because that's a cycle. But that is not the promise. The real promise is about helping you reach that plateau, your own personal plateau. And on the plateau, you have time to focus. You focus on things that had value, business value. <laughs> Serious business value. <laughs> These people have added a lot of business value, so they're going to continue celebrating for some time. <laughs> like a lot of business value happened here. <laughs> On the plateau, you have time to think. And you start thinking, and you're like, okay, I'm thinking. And you start thinking, maybe my boss is an idiot. I'm not saying it's true, I'm just saying you have time to think about it. And since you focus on business value, you can afford to fire your boss. And then you do. And you turn out all right. And you get to have your own midlife crisis the way that you want to have it. But that's another talk. And that's it till the next episode. Thank you.